Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Good Friday service. Our uh, Good Friday service is according to the Tenebrae tradition. And I'll just read that little opening paragraph in your bulletin where it says, The service of Tenebrae, meaning darkness or shadows, is a service of prolonged meditation on the suffering of Christ leading up to the cross. Various readings trace his journey into death on our behalf. The music expresses his sufferings. The power of silence with the darkening sanctuary suggests the emotion of this momentous day. Finally, the conclusion brings the anticipation of joy for ultimate victory. So you'll notice as we go on through the service that the uh, building will become uh, successively darker as we uh, meditate on the death of Christ. And then at the end, we'll talk about its meaning. So let's join our hearts together in prayer as we begin, please. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together and remember the death of Christ on the cross. We thank you for Good Friday. We thank you that you so loved the world that you gave your only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Will you please be with us, Lord, and, and help us uh, indeed to think deeply about the death of Christ. Help us to honor him. Help us to sanctify him in our hearts. And help us, Lord, to, to listen to your word. And then, yes, Lord, help us to rejoice because Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. So be with us now, we pray. Be glorified in our midst. In Jesus' worthy name, amen. amen. Matthew 26, verses 20 through 25. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as, is, as it was written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so.
I'll be reading from Matthew 26, verses 36 through 50. Jesus prays in Gethsemane. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And talking, and taking with him Peter and two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and, and watch with me. And going a little further, and going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples, and he found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, So, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my, see, my betrayer is at hand. Verse 47, Betrayal and Arrest of Jesus. While he was still speaking, Judas came. One of the twelve with him, a great crowd with swords and clubs. From the chief priests and the elders of, uh, of the people, now the betrayer had given to them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. Whatever posture you find works best for you. Um, you. In other words, you are invited to sing with us.
Then all the disciples left him and fled. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered, and Peter was following behind him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest, and going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus, that they might put him to death, but they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last two came forward and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer to make? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said it, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witness do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spit him in the face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it who struck you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him and said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied it with an oath, I do not know the man. After a little while, The bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Matthew 27, 11 through 14, 
and 20 through 30. Jesus before Pilate. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release to you for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with this, with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, He took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus unto the governor's headquarters, And they gathered the whole battalion before him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and twisted together a crown of thorns. They put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand, and kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. As they went, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. 
And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests, when the scribes, with the scribes and the elders, mocked him, saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel, let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God, let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Matthew 27, 45 to 54. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders, hearing it, said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God.
Matthew 27, 57 through 61. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him, and Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb.
I'm going to read for you from Isaiah chapter 53. We've obvious, obviously been reading from the Gospel of Matthew when uh, Matthew recorded the actual events of the suffering, the betrayal, the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, now we're rewinding some 700 plus years to the time of the prophet Isaiah when he so clearly wrote about the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Matthew tells us about the events, and uh, Isaiah not only prophesies about those events, but he explains in advance why. Why would God's servant, his chosen one, suffer the way that he did? Why would he die the way that he did? It explains, Isaiah 53 does, why this dark event, the death of Jesus, we celebrate on Good Friday. It's why the death of Jesus is the center of the good news of the gospel. So here we go, Isaiah chapter 53. Um, as Chapter 52 comes to a close. God, through Isaiah, speaks of uh, my servant who will act wisely and who will be lifted up and exalted. He goes on to speak about that suffering servant in chapter 53. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should des desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. And now the tone begins to change as Isaiah anticipates the resurrection of Jesus. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. 
Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his, death, his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. So there's the gospel laid out in the language of prophecy through the prophet Isaiah. Um, the Apostle Paul puts this really succinctly in 1 Corinthians 15.3 when he wrote, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. And the scriptures certainly include Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, this chapter, Isaiah 53, is quoted at least seven times in the New Testament. There are many more allusions to it than that, but it's quoted seven times. And one of those times is in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, where Peter wrote, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Clearly, Jesus fulfills this prophecy. So much so that I've read stories about, for example, a Jewish woman who visited a Jewish synagogue and went in there, and they were reading from Isaiah chapter 53, and uh, she thought that she had taken a wrong turn or something and ended up in a Christian church because she recognized how clearly Isaiah 53 speaks about Jesus. And also in various places and times, there have been uh, groups of Jewish leaders who in the consecutive reading in the synagogues actually skip Isaiah chapter 53. So they read chapter 52, and then the next Sabbath they read chapter 54. They can't handle how clearly Isaiah speaks about Jesus. So in Isaiah chapter 53, we're told the, good, the bad news, first of all, the bad news has to do with us. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The New Testament emphasizes this fact and says things like, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all rebels by nature. We're all self-willed by nature. We, we don't want God to rule over us. We don't want to keep his commandments. And that's what sin is. That's the bad news. But then there's the language of substitution that uh, is repeated so many times in Isaiah chapter 53. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities in verse 5. And he was stricken for the transgression of my people in verse 8. Um, he shall bear their iniquities, verse, verse 11, and he bore the sin of many. Jesus is our substitute. He died for our sins. And that is why God is able to be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. That's why God is able to maintain the integrity of his righteousness and holiness while forgiving sinners at the same time. God doesn't just ignore our sins. He dealt with our sins in the death of Jesus, his sons. Our sins were actually, literally punished in Jesus. Our guilt was laid on Jesus. And then the result of that is our justification. You'll notice that um, in verse 11, it says, out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied by his knowledge, shall the righteous one, my servant, 
make many to be accounted righteous. The, the New Testament applies the, the word in English justified or justification for that reality. This is what happens when someone has saving faith in Jesus, when we believe in Jesus, trust in Jesus. God, because of Jesus, accounts us as righteous. He declares us not just innocent, but he declares us actually righteous because of what Jesus has done in our place. And then, of course, there's resurrection that Isaiah speaks of in verse 10, and uh, that speaks about the resurrection of Jesus. If Jesus would not have been raised from the dead, then we would have no assurance that his death was sufficient to atone for our sins. But Jesus was raised from the dead. He didn't stay dead, but God raised him from the dead on the third day, signifying, among other things, that his death has been accepted by God as payment in full, so that the last utterance of Jesus from the cross, it is finished, was absolutely true and accurate. Jesus Christ has died to secure our salvation, and then it also guarantees our future resurrection. Jesus rose, and so shall I, so shall you. Jesus was raised from the dead, and eventually all believers will be raised from the dead as well with him, and we're going to be with him forever. We're going to see him as he is. Our bodies are going to be glorified to be like his glorified body, and we're going to live forever on the new earth on which heaven dwells. Heaven will be on earth, and all of that is because of the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's, here's a new, another New Testament reference to the death of Jesus, and this makes the whole event so personal. This is the Apostle Paul. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. And so the death of Jesus is not just something that we look back on theoretically or in some detached, impersonal way. But when we think about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's very, very practical. It has uh, practical implications for our lives. It affects the way that we live. For example, Jesus died for sin. And as believers, we have died to sin in him. If Jesus died for our sins, why would we continue in sin? And also, just as we had faith in Jesus, the, the moment that we were saved, at the beginning of our journey of salvation, so we go on day by day, moment by moment, trusting in Jesus, looking to Jesus, following Jesus, loving Jesus having faith in Jesus. His death has very personal and enduring ramifications for us as believers. And if you're not a believer tonight, we're very glad that you're here, and we're glad that you got to hear these portions from the Word of God so that you got to hear the gospel, the, the good news that is based on the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's so incredible to me, it's so awesome to me, that what the Lord requires of you is not for you uh, to go and do a whole bunch of religious exercises, uh, go off into purgatory for some period of time, go off into the mountains and 
suffer for a period of time, all he requires of you is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And his promise to you is, you will be saved. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gift of your Son, for the salvation of the world. We thank you, Lord, for his work in saving us. We look back at our lives and there's been so much rebellion and sin, so much wasted time, wasted opportunities. And we're so glad that Jesus has saved us. We're so glad that he has redeemed our lives. Thank you, Lord, that now that we're in Jesus, there is therefore now no condemnation for us. We don't have to fear death because by dying, Jesus defeated death. And we thank you that on the third day, Jesus was raised from the dead. We thank you that we have a great and glorious future to look forward to. Would you help us, Lord, to die to ourselves and die to our sins, die to the philosophies and ways and values of this world and live for Jesus? Would you help us, Lord, to live optimistic and hope-filled, Christ-like lives? And would you help us, Lord, to look forward to his ultimate return? Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. amen. May Jesus Christ, who for our sake became obedient unto death, even death on a cross, keep you and strengthen you. And yes, we will see you, Lord willing, on Easter morning. God bless you.